Hey, hello, Yin. Hi, and Edwin. hello, everyone. Edwin, good to see you. Good to see you too. Right. I feel like most of us know you quite well. You have appeared a lot of times um, on FME. So I'm going to ask you something a bit different. Okay. So I'm going to ask you um, what hobbies or interests do you enjoy doing that would help you wind down from the busyness of work? Um, and why do you enjoy them? Okay. Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, I, I think now, nowadays, I, I really have very limited time when it comes to hobbies. <laughs> um, but I guess one thing I do enjoy in my downtime uh, is uh, watching basketball. So I really am into like NBA and I'm really into uh, basketball. And if you guys know who recently won the Golden State Warriors, yeah, um, that's the team that I support. And um, the reason why I really like it is um, I, I think you know, there's something interesting about professional athletes, um, the kind of grit that they have and the kind of focus that they have. I feel that uh, it actually reminds me a lot of how we should be as Christian athletes. So for me, like just, um, I enjoy the sport as, as on its own, but I also do see a lot of um, helpful uh, metaphors that I can, I can actually bring into like ministry. Exam for example, even like how they work together as a team and how uh, when we do ministry, we, we cannot do ministry alone. We need to uh, work together as a team and everyone needs to know their roles and they need to do their roles well and for that ministry to be able to flourish. So I, I think there's um, one of the reasons why I enjoy watching the uh, NBA so much. Uh, it's it's one of those reasons. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know you were a, an NBA fan, but yeah, I used to watch NBA as well. And <clears throat> I like how you can relate, you know, NBA and professional sports into Christian ministry. And it's so relatable, right? As uh, I think in various um, Paul's letters, he used many analogies from like sports, professional elites, and apply it to Christian lives. And I think that's fair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, so second question. So you mentioned that you're very <clears throat> busy, right? So apart from busy working as a Christian doctor, and we know that all of life is ministry to Jesus, you are also very active in church ministries, and you even co-founded FME. So what have you learned from leading FME so far? Yeah, I mean, um, I've learned quite a few things, um, things that have uh, humbled me as well as someone that is a, uh, as a servant, ultimately, uh, trying to serve uh, Jesus. Um, but I mean, like, when, I, when we say like co-founder, it sounds as if like, I did like half the work or something like that. But actually, honestly speaking, it was a huge team effort. So, um, you know, uh, really thankful for the team that we have. You know, we have Chin, we have Paul, we have Albert, we have a lot of people working together to make these events work. Um, but uh, back to the original question, which is what is the thing that I've learned? I've learned a few things, but I think one of them has to probably be um, the importance of uh, conviction for not just the gospel, but ministry, because it is really, really hard to, uh, it's quite challenging, I think, to lead a, a group of essentially volunteers. So, I mean, they are, we're like, we're all Christians and we all are convicted by the gospel. We think that this ministry is worthwhile, our time and our effort and energies, but uh, it is a different type of challenge to try to lead uh, people who are not being, you know, for example, being like paid or doing it full time. So, so to say like, you know, from Monday to Friday, that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the, just in a busy world that we live in and just being doctors as well, where our baseline busyness is, is there. I think that's definitely the, the challenge uh, for myself as well as uh, trying to lead others um, in, in doing this ministry. But um, I've been always very encouraged to see the, the sacrificial love and the time that people have put into that. There's so much work going on behind the scenes, you know, and just to make it work. And, and for me, I just feel that uh, that's deeply encouraging to me. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that. A lot of work actually are behind the scenes, right? Like, you know, a lot of work um, goes into arranging the events and all that. And people are working, you know, around the clock. And then on top of that, we have ministries, other ministries. And, and I can definitely understand that, you know, it is the kind of sacrifice, sacrificial love that we have for each other that keeps us going, right? Right. So um, last question. Now about the talk title tonight, um, the idolatry at work, without giving away too much, which aspects of work might make you personally prone to idolize your work? Okay, so I mean, um, I can answer this in a personal, um, in a personal point of view. 
uh, so it wouldn't give away my talk in a sense. Um, but I think for me personally, as I come to understand myself a bit better, uh, being a Christian doctor working for the past eight years, um, I, I do realize that um, there is that temptation to perhaps put too much trust uh, or confidence in kind of the, the security in which medicine can provide. Because um, as, as a job that we've seen in the pandemic, uh, there's, the, I mean, doctors are, um, it's a pretty stable job. And, and it's very, it feels very secure. It feels very, especially when you're working in the government, then you can kind of understand what I mean, especially if you're in the older generation where you have like a, a you have a permanent contract. So I think that that, that definitely uh, is something that I have to definitely watch out for. And I need to uh, ask for um, accountability from my wife, uh, from uh, people from my church as well, people that I, I trust, people that are mature and can, and can also speak truth in love uh, because it, it, it makes... It can make one uh, less prone to taking risks for ministry. And, and that's what ministry uh, involves a lot of. It involves a lot of risks. And, and so I, I, can, I can see how, like, over time, if I'm not careful, I can be more uh, domesticated as well as I, as I uh, find that, find more, like, so-called uh, confidence or trust in this, the job security. So it's definitely something that, that um, it challenged me even as I was writing this talk as well. And I'm sure that uh, maybe hopefully some of you guys can relate to that. And hopefully the talk will be a huge blessing to the listeners. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And I hope, um, I guess we all can relate in some ways to, you know, the, the, the things that you have spoken. And I hope um, the talk later will, you know, address even more of this. So we're looking forward to that talk. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, right. It's almost time for the talk. But before Dr. Edwin comes in again, we will have a short launch this. Uh, launch question discussion. So like last month, um, our IT team will sort you into your respective networking groups, and then we can spend around 10 minutes um, edifying and encouraging one another while we discuss this launch question. And then when, when you come back, um, I will read today's scripture, and then uh, Dr. Eldrin will come in, and then we'll launch straight into his talk. So the launch, launch question is, what do you treasure most in life? Right, so spend around 10 minutes um, to discuss with your group mates. Okay, now see you again. Okay, before we begin, um, I'll read the scripture for today, which is taken from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 18 to 30. So some background of this passage, right? So in this passage, we can see um, the heart of what idolatry looks like. Um, even though it may not seem obvious at the beginning of the dialogue, uh, between the young ruler and uh, Jesus. But um, as you read along through Jesus' series of questions, we are able to understand better what idol idolatry may uh, look like, even though um, people may seem to have good intentions. Okay, so with that in mind, let me read um, the scripture. Verse 18. And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All this I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Now, let's get uh, Dr. Audrey up and he can 
start the talk. All right, thanks so much, Ian. Um, okay, before I start, I um, just want to give a huge uh, thanks for uh, coming and um, attending as well. I'm really glad that I have this chance to um, share the word of God with you guys, especially on such an important topic as uh, the idolatry of work, right? Um, this is part two of my talk, which I actually started last month. Um, and But before we start, I just want everyone to just be, you know, relaxed and um, you know if I could invite you guys to turn on your cameras that'd be great I saw that quite a lot of cameras were on during the picture so I think it's okay if you need to like eat or whatever you need to like move around it's or, or whatever you know um, it's it's completely fine I'm, I'm pretty chill about that if you want to eat you want to drink it's fine um, but yeah if you have your cameras on then um, I will actually look at you guys whenever I I preach and that really helps me to kind of just be aware of who I'm talking to um, so that I'm not just reading off like some script or something like that. Like I, I know that I'm talking to someone. So uh, if you can, that'd be great. But if you can't, if you're like, you know, inconvenient or whatever, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. But uh, I definitely appreciate it. So anyways, um, yeah. Um, evening, everyone. It's great to see um, your faces. Uh, most of you guys, um, as you know, my name is Elduin and I'm currently working as an ENT surgical trainee at HUKM. And so all together, I've worked for about eight years as a doctor and I've gone through my fair share of temptations in terms of idolizing work. Um, I think uh, anyone that says that they've, they've never been tempted to idolize work, um, I think they are lying <laughs> because uh, there's definitely going to be that temptation. And, and I know that I'm not alone in this because I've met and discussed with many fellow Christians along this journey as a working adult and um, not just medics, but even non-medics. And I've found that we've all faced very similar issues with the world's temptations. Uh, quite frankly, um, I don't think it matters whether or not you're a new Christian or one who has walked with the Lord for many years. Uh, the struggle to be faithful and to turn away from idolatry is something that we must all uh, learn to deal with. And it's not merely an issue for the so-called immature or the new in faith to deal with. Uh, on the contrary, sometimes it is those who are mature, who, who think that they are mature, that they tend to fall into this trap of idolatry because they presume that they are spiritually okay. Um, and I'll talk about that later as well. And so in uh, my preparation for this talk, the Lord has made it clear to me again and again that when it comes to matters uh, pertaining sin and idolatry, no one is above reproach. And that is the posture with which I ask that we all approach this topic tonight with uh, a posture of humility. So let us pray and ask God for his grace as we are reminded of the pervasive uh, dangers of idolatry and the need to take to heart uh, the things that we are about to hear today. So please join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we commit this entire time into your hands, and I pray, Lord, that um, you would give me wisdom in um, speaking clearly and faithfully, uh, truthfully to um, the attendees tonight, our brothers and sisters, uh, regarding this important topic of idolatry of work. Um, help us, Lord, to uh, come to grips with uh, the dangers of idolatry and help us as well to repent as necessary. And I pray, Lord, that if if I speak anything um, in, that takes your name in vain or to, that is not faithful to your word, I pray that, uh, that they will not remember it. And Lord, uh, on the same note, uh, if what I say is faithful to the... is a very similar topic titled um, preached in October as well by Dr. Chu Yun Jae. Yeah? Um, I'm not sure if Yun Jae is here today, but uh, yeah, I think he's moving to another new job or something like that. So, okay. But anyways, uh, he preached in October and I think he did a really good job of actually helping us to understand how the root of all sin is idolatry. It's quite interesting to think about that, right? Because normally we would think that the root of idolatry is sin. That, that's easy to understand, but he, he kind of put it the other way around. And I think that uh, it's quite clear that it's because it involves us worshipping something else other than God. So the problem is often not as simple as just worshipping our... The, the problem is just worshipping our jobs, maybe loving it too much, loving it more than Jesus, right? But it can also be less obvious. For example, have you ever found yourself complaining bitterly in your heart, right? Or wondering uh, why you're putting yourself through all that stress, but yet still 
working really hard and being dedicated and all that. Well, um, it could be that that's a sign that you don't worship your job necessarily, but instead you worship what you perceive your job as being able to do for you. Okay. So it's tied to your job, but it's not your job per se. So that is still idolatry. Now, this uh, may be uh, the ability to, uh, this might be something like continuing to live at a particular standard of living, or it could be the feeling of um, financial stability or even a sense of self-worth, a sense of self-purpose. It can manifest itself in these ways, idolatry. Uh, it could be many things, and I'm just naming a few things to trigger you to think. But then to continue the flow of logic, uh, it still ends up about serving me, myself, and I. And so the heart of idolatry is really about worshiping ourselves instead of God. Uh, and this is the objective for tonight's talk, to have a timely and godly reminder of what idolatry is, how what can play a role in that, and our next step to correct the wrongs in our lives under God. And so I thought it would be apt for us to start with a brief recap of May's talk, the talk for last a month uh, entitled The Challenge of Work as Christians. Uh, as I mentioned, right, this is part two. So some of what I'm going to say today is actually based off of what I've already covered um, last month. So uh, please do go and catch up on that talk. If you haven't listened to it yet, you'll still be able to benefit from today's talk, but you would definitely um, understand so much more if you actually attended um, last month as well, okay? Um, but yeah, last month, what I did was I spoke on how sin and how our corrupted hearts have perverted uh, the way that we work in the sense that we do not work according to God's design and purpose, which is to serve him and to keep his word. But thanks be to Christ Jesus, whom in his death and re resurrection, we have received forgiveness, guys. We have just received redemption and also new life by his spirit. And that means as Jesus' disciples, um, our work becomes an instrument. It becomes a means, a platform, an opportunity to express our faithfulness and love for God's son. But um, obviously not all is going to be fine and dandy at work just because you have professed faith in Christ Jesus. It's not going to automatically work itself out and everything in your life is going to be aligned to God's work. Would. Um, the truth is that there is going to be a different kind of struggle, a different kind of challenge uniquely experienced by Christians who seek to be faithful to Jesus in their jobs and careers. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not natural. Um, and this really shouldn't come as any surprise because brothers and sisters, we are now living in the overlap of, eight, of two ages. We, on one hand, we're still suffering under the curse of sin and fighting against the tendencies of the old Adam while having our minds renewed by the spirit into the image of Christ on the other hand. And practically, this means that we're still susceptible and prone to having the wrong sinful mindset towards our jobs. And this can be divided into uh, at least two major categories, which is idolatry and idleness at work. And so tonight, I'll be speaking primarily on idolatry. And then next month, you can hear, come back to hear from Dr. Paul um, who will talk about the issues of idleness at work, which is also another, another mindset which is wrong when, when coming to approach work under Christ. And of course, by idle, what I, I don't mean is just to be lazy at work, although that can also be a problem for some of you. Um, so do make sure that you come back for next month's FME talk to get down to the bottom of this important and related issue. But yes, we need to move on. Um, Firstly, what is idolatry and why is it so dangerous? Why is it spiritually dangerous? Well, in an essay written by uh, Ben Glad, Dr. Benjamin Glad for the Gospel Coalition, um, he gave this clear and succinct definition of idolatry. Hopefully one of the ushers can share the link over there in the chat. Uh, but this is his definition. And, and I like it because it's succinct and it's clear. He said this, idolatry is the worship of something other than God is at the root of all sin because sin seeks to steal glory from God to whom alone it is due and take it for the sinner. So I'll give you a few seconds. Let it sink in for a second there. Idolatry is the worship of something other than God is at the root of all sin because sin seeks to steal glory from God to whom alone it is due and take it for the sinner. So this is quite helpful, isn't it? Because it means that idolatry, it's not just about worshipping statues, right? Or gold idols, 
<laughs> a lot of modern idols are mental, not metal. And here's what we need to understand clearly. Idolatry is a serious offense to God. And it's considered a sin because it ultimately, like what Ben Glad said, seeks to steal glory from God. Let's look at Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, right? And this is what it says. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now think about that for a moment. Who deserves all glory, honor, and power? Well, the Bible says that our Lord and God does. It belongs to him. He alone is worthy because he is the creator of the universe and he is our maker. That is to say that we wouldn't even have the faculties of thought or consciousness as sentient beings if it weren't for God. So now imagine us trying to then steal God's well-deserved glory. This is what we need to think about every single time that we're tempted to idolize anything other than Jesus. I'm trying to get you guys all to basically just see how serious of sin idolatry is. It is much nearer to home than what we realize or what we, we see in the movies, you know, of what is an idol. And furthermore, I hope that from here you guys can see how stupid and how ridiculous it is that we would even think of worshipping something other than God. Okay, and guys, it's got to be more than just intellectual knowledge and extent, because that's not good enough. We've actually uh, got to come and to a point of repentance. But let's look at a couple more important cross, cross references to bring this out clearer. Um, if you have a Bible, definitely it would be great for you to flip it through. But look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20, 23. I'll read it for you guys. For although they knew God... They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Here, I want to make two important points about idolatry. First, notice how does this exchange of God's glory for images, okay? resembling man, birds, etc. And this is a result of sinful man thinking that they are wise when in fact they were fools. So our act of idolatry is a proof positive that we are actually just foolish, dumb, stupid. There's no, there's no nice way to put it. And what's worse is that there's a certain lack of self-awareness about this sin of idolatry because the Bible says that we claim to be wise and in doing that became fools. You only become fools in claiming to be wise if your claims are completely and utterly wrong. And there is a certain blindness that comes with idolatry, not just a lack of awareness, but a, a complete blindness, a spiritual blindness. If you were able to realize it, then it would only be by God's grace. Second, we can see that the effect of continual idolatry will lead to our thinking becoming futile and our hearts darkened. There's a certain, that is to say that there's a certain domino effect to the sin of idolatry. And once you're trapped in it, your thinking and everything will progressively degrade and degenerate into something more and more ungodly. You know, in that same chapter, it's really interesting because if you look to verse 32, it says, it says this, just look at it. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Paul says this same group of people, the idolaters, they know such things, they deserve to die. Yet, they do them. And they give approval to those who do them. So, it's the equivalent of spiritual suicide, isn't it? Imagine putting a gun to your head. and You know it's going to kill you. And yet, you go and blow out your brains. The craziness of that. Spiritual suicide. But just before that, to make things worse, you put that gun in your child's hands and you allow them to blow out their brains. Now, I'm sorry to use such a, uh, such a vivid uh, image, of, especially with so much gun violence happening in the US and all this, but, but this is something that, like I said, is, is close to home and we need to realize kind of the horror of idolatry. See, God's not going to sit idly by as we corrupt ourselves and worship something other than him we'll definitely, most certainly, 100% face his judgment. And in these two points, we can already see just 
how spiritually dangerous idolatry is. One last verse, which I hope that will help us to be more sensitized to the horror and the dangers of idolatry and to be aware of what is at stake. Um, have a look at 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. And it reads, do you, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. With this baseline understanding of what the Bible says about idolatry, right, I hope that we can actually now turn to our attention to, work, to working out what idolatry may look like. Because it, it's clear, right, <laughs> idolaters are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But let's, let's work out what it actually looks like. And look, here's the thing. Um, I am a doctor. So this is a disclaimer. I am a doctor. And to that extent, I understand better the nuances of idolatry uh, in medicine as a doctor or maybe even as an ex medical student so many years ago. So a lot of my examples might tend to be more medically related, but I want you to know, right? I, uh, whether you are a dentist, you even if you're not a medical doctor, if you're a physiotherapist, if you're a foundation science student, if you're someone working in the biotech and biomedical industry or, or whatever, you know, um, that the theological principle is still the same. There's so much to be gained from. And also the Christian muscle of sniffing out and confessing our idolatry of work is the same. In fact, to me, I think the greater challenge is trying to bridge that gap uh, between what scripture teaches us on the topic and how that, that's manifested in our thinking about our jobs and careers. Because not, I think that's the tough part, right? We, we're not able to see how it may manifest. So we're going to spend a little time talking about that after this. And so I hope that if you've been following along since my last talk, you have enough negative and positive motivation to actively seek out the fires of idolatry in your life and to extinguish it before it extinguishes you. <laughs> because quite frankly, your life depends on it. And we mustn't take for granted God's patience and kindness. On this, there's a quick side note I just want to make. And, and you know what, this is, at the end of the day, what FME is about. We really don't want to pretend that everything and everyone is okay. You know, we look around and know that the current situation among Malaysian Christian healthcare workers is a dire one. Uh, we think our biggest issue is waiting for nine months for housemanship or being on a contract basis, or the difficulties and the delays of specializing you know, locally. But they're not. Here's a reality check. They're not. That's not the biggest issue. We've got much bigger problems at hand, and they are of the spiritual variety, which is being masked by all these different worldly challenges. And here at FME, we really want to honor Jesus with this one short life that we have on earth before we join in eternal worship of Jesus in the new heavens and earth. And we recognize that we do what we do here in the overlapping of ages, as we wait for Jesus' return, it matters to God. It really does. It matters to Jesus. Because Jesus, God des uh, desires faithfully obedient worshipers, so much so he sent his son to die on a cross to secure people for himself. And so in FME, this is what we're trying to do, right? And this is what we're trying to do. Maybe you're wondering, why is my tone like this? Why am I talking like this? But, but at the end of the day, it comes from a place of love for God and love for you guys. So I hope, um, yeah, um, that uh, moving on, um, what idolatry of what may look like, right? So we, we've covered what idolatry is and uh, kind of how dangerous it is. Then now let's try to work out a little bit more of what that might look like. Because sometimes it's not as obvious as it seems. Actually, most of the times it's not that obvious, okay? So I think a really good starting point would be for us to first look at the rich young ruler in the passage that we just read, that Ian just read for us. There's a lot that we can learn from the passage as we read together. So if you have a look back at that passage, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 30. He says, um, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said back to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept uh, from my youth. And have you realized something? Have you realized in that verse, out of the few commandments from the 10 commandments that Jesus lists out to the rich young ruler, he didn't mention the first two commandments, which is that you shall have no other gods before me and you shall not make any idols. Yeah. I doubt that uh, 
if he did mention that in the list, I, I doubt that the rich young ruler could reply what he did in verse 21, which is that with confidence, he says, I kept all of it since I was young. But this highlights perfectly the issue with the rich young ruler, doesn't it? Because the issue is that he does have an idol. Right? I have no doubt that he, maybe he never committed adultery. He never could. Yeah, but he does harbor an idol. And Jesus is about to reveal it later on in the dialogue. That idol that he has is his money, his wealth, the security and the status that comes with it. Because when asked to give all of that up, how did the rich young ruler re uh, reply? Well, he became very sad because he was very rich. I guess to some extent, we can all resonate with the rich young ruler, can't we? It's not easy to give up everything that you work so hard for your whole life. But the key thing about this sadness, which is different than other sadnesses, is that it kept, it prevented the rich young ruler from following Jesus. And that's the point. That when you, that's one of the points. When you idolize something, it will keep you from following Jesus. Because A, you desire your idol more than Jesus. And B, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So applying to our context, we have to ask ourselves, do we love our jobs more than Jesus? Do we desire our jobs and what they can provide for us, whether it's wealth, security, status, do we desire those things more than what Jesus has to offer? We may be poor in the, in the money sense. It can be as poor as the Macedonian church, but we could have, but have the riches of his glorious inheritance as, as saints. And that would be more worthy. We may not have the job security, for example, but rest assured that we can still be fully secure in our identity and salvation found in Christ Jesus. We may not have the highest status in the society, but if we have the status as adopted sons of God through our union with Christ Jesus, that is more than enough. Now, I'm not saying that uh, wealth, security, and status um, are necessarily bad or evil. But what I am saying is, don't make it your idol. These things are temporary, and they pale in comparison to the immense spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And we'll only grow to appreciate all that we have in Jesus the more that we study his word. Otherwise, we won't know. Now, working hard, being dedicated, responsible, and punctual are all good things. And I want to say it for the record, okay? So if you want to quote me, you can say, okay, the, yeah, working hard, being dedicated, being responsible, being a safe doctor, these are all important things, okay? I, I don't know how it is that in the first talk, somehow one of the attendees kind of mistook Albert. <laughs> somehow mistook Albert, right, Albert? I don't know how they mistook Al Albert to, to try to, like, as if Albert is trying to imply that, you know, being responsible at work is not something a Christian should do or something like that, just because you're active in church ministry. No, we're not saying that, Okay. But here's the tricky thing about idolatry. The, thi the tricky thing is whether we're doing all these things, being dedicated, responsible, punctual, effective, blah, 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 whether we're doing it out of a worship onto God or doing it in order to attain the idols of our heart. Because externally, they look the same. So this is where we have to be honest with ourselves and with God and really consider what is in our hearts. Are we doing it because we feel accomplished and we feel better, a, a, a bigger self-esteem boost when, when we, when we are doing it, you know? So do our hearts long for Jesus's return or that next paycheck more? Do, do we get more excited when pondering about the wondrous majesty of God or more excited when we get a job promotion and an annual bonus? I found that it's, helpful practically to try to compare the relative joy and desires that you have for the world and the things of God, because it's not like wrong to be like happy, right? To get a bonus or to be, to be happy, to get a promotion. It's not, it's not wrong to be happy in or thankful to God for that. Right. But how do you know when it's become idolatrous? It's helpful to compare, right? Relatively. It's really when it really regularly applies a place in your heart, that it reveals your desire for this idol more than God. And that's when it becomes a problem. Of course, the ultimate litmus test uh, that we can always ask ourselves, and when we ask ourselves this question, we should, we should pause for, uh, for a while and really, really be honest with ourselves because sometimes we're too quick to just say, uh, yes, you know. But a question that we could ask ourselves is, would we be willing to give up your jobs and careers to follow Jesus, right? If that was what God called you to do. 
Uh, and I feel this is that it, it, I feel this is a very extremely important question to ask ourselves regularly, because if we aren't, then it's probably likely that our job or career can become an idol already, or maybe has become an idol already. So my next point on what idolatry might look like uh, is when our jobs become an obsessive focal point where we pour the best of our energies, time, and passion into. Okay, note what I'm saying. It's where we pour the best of our energies, time, and passion into. So you might still be involved here and there with church work or doing ministry here and there, but that is the leftover of your energies. It's not the best of your energies. You're giving the best of your energies into your job. And, and that's where um, it can sometimes be one of the manifestations of idolatry of work. And so oftentimes we are willing to do uh, whatever it is uh, that in that job uh, at the expense of church, family, and friends. Sometimes it, it appears as is a uh, overwillingness to do it. And as a result, our job will become our primary identity because it is such a big part of who you are and what you spend your time on. And as a result, it becomes our source of ultimate satisfaction as well. So how might that look like? It actually might look like uh, a couple of different ways, right? If, if, if your job has become your source of ultimate satisfaction, it might look like constant frustration when something is not achieved yet at work, right? You can kind of understand how that, that, that's logical, right? On the other hand, it might look like a deep-seated satisfaction when you've accomplished that something in work. So it's, it's hard to really look at just a one-off situation, when it, whether it be in exams or meeting a deadline or, or whatever. It's really looking at the pattern of satisfaction which fluctuates according to what happens at work, whether something has been achieved or has failed to be achieved. And closely, closely related to this manifestation is also always wanting to talk about work outside of work right? You, you sure you have some friends like that. Maybe you're one of them. <laughs> Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you thrust that when I say this, okay? But I have a lot of the Christian friends, always uh, Christian doctors, right? That always talking about work outside of work, you know? And, and not that there's anything about work, but I'm just saying that it can be a manifestation of idolatry, right? Especially if that becomes our identity, it becomes our source of satisfaction and all these things. Because when you talk about work, you know that, that you can never finish talking about work. We all know this. And as a doctor, um, I've actually had um, a lot of, not just doctor friends, but even some, I think some dentists and pharmacists, which have a very strong tendency to talk about uh, work all the time. And it kind of gives me an idea of what occupies their mind uh, most of the time. Now, um, what really strikes me odd when I have these kind of um, hangouts or catch-ups with my friends, these are Christians, by the way, right? Christian healthcare workers, is that whenever the topic of the Bible or something about church or ministry is brought up, suddenly that zeal and excitement in that conversation is zapped and it disappears and it just leaves the room. And what is replaced is the awkwardness, the deafening silence, okay? And I think that, that this is where you can really see where like, okay, so what's in that person's heart? Right? And it's not something that, that when I'm saying it, I'm not thinking that, oh, hey, therefore I'm self-righteous and you know, I'm better than them or what. No, but it's like, I'm trying to talk to you about what idolatry might look like. So it's something that we need to address. Um, we also, it, it's, it's natural if you think about it, because we want to talk about things that excite us the most. And if that's our job that excites us the most, then that's what we're going to end up talking about the most. If the gospel is what excites us the most, if what we learn about God and the scriptures the other day excites us the most, we're going to end up talking about that the most when we're talking to our Christian brothers and sisters. What we talk about um, a lot shows what's going on on the inside most of the times. Now, there's so many more examples, but I just want to trigger you to start thinking more about what idolatry of work might look like in a Christian healthcare worker's life. The point that I want to make here is that idolatry reveals itself in mundane and otherwise acceptable external speech and behaviors. You're not going to go and see someone who idolizes their job. You're not going to go see them burning some incense, bowing at the hospital main lobby. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's not going to look like that, guys. Okay? And the second point that I want to make is that idolatry is, is very much a matter of the heart, something internally. And it is extremely hard to judge based on the external only. Because a faithful Christian and an idolatrous one can both be seen as hardworking and responsible for just one example to give. But unfortunately, coming from a very different core, and um, that's actually where idolatry is 
to be exposed. Having said all of this, uh, can you think of any other examples of how idolatry of work might look like in our in our healthcare field among Christian brothers and sisters? Something that we can discuss more about during our question and comment session, maybe. And also definitely want to encourage you guys to stay back for the um, the networking group sessions as well, so that we can hash this out a little bit better. If you have questions, do type it out on Slido, right? So that um, hopefully I can try to give some thoughts on that later after this talk. I definitely think that we need to have more of these conversations among Christian brothers and sisters in the healthcare field, uh, especially about how idolatry looks like, how do we extinguish it, and how do we repent and, and, and uh, live a life that is faithful and honoring to God uh, moving forward. I think we need to have more of these conversations rather than how to survive at the workplace, how to specialize, how to this one. Yeah. And so um, the next point is therefore the need to check our hearts regularly and also the cure for our idolatry. One thing is for sure is that there's a need to check internally our hearts and to check it regularly. And I honestly think, right, that listening to faithful preaching of God's word week after week at a healthy church and being committed to a Bible study fellowship, which earnestly seeks out to live faithful lives onto Jesus is essential. And this is in addition to that personal growth, maturity, sharpening of our own theological understanding of God worship, because there's only so much that we can do if we know uh, the correct answers to ask ourselves. As we learn, idolatry and sin have a self-blinding effect to it. And when you're in it and already worshiping something other than the true God, it's really difficult to self-gauge accurately. So it's worth remembering something that Jesus has said about man's sinful hearts. And that goes for all of us because all of us have sinful hearts. And he says it in Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. It's a very sobering truth, but it's an important one for us to, to bring with us uh, every day. He says this, from within... Out of the heart of a man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Work itself is not the problem. It's our sinful hearts. And it's worth mentioning also that sometimes we may start off with pure and good intentions, but that doesn't mean that that remains the fact months and years down the road. Idol things change. Things can change. Idolatry do not, does not have a specific incubation period, and it can happen to any one of us, even the mature, if we do not regularly check our hearts. And so at the end of the day, what's the fix for idolatry of work? Well, we must recognize that the bottom line is that in this world, this world is not ultimately worth living for. God alone is worth living for. Only God can bring lasting satisfaction and joy. And if we have made work or what work promises to give or provide you into an idol for whatever reason, then what we need to do is we need to repent. We need to actually discard that thinking and turn from it and embrace a completely new God worship, God centered thinking. We need to turn away from that futile, that wrong way of thinking and recognize idolatry of work for what it is. And we need to take ownership of it, take responsibility of it, and then refocus our minds such that we understand work is a worship to God as what I covered in my previous talk. And this brings me to my um, last and final point, which is, where's the church in all of this, right? You're probably thinking like, why does Eldon always talk about church? Like, why does he always bring it back to church and Bible fellowship? Like, what's up with this dude? Like, is he some pious, like, you know, like always going to church on Sundays and Bible study and no, no, no. It's like, not that. It's not that. Let me make the point very clear, right? That to recognize and to confess and to repent of our adultery, of work is important, is very important. But we have to also realize that we can't do this alone, right? We, made, we saw earlier, right? We, I made the point earlier that our hearts are deceitful and though it is possible by his spirit to recognize our own sins, um, it certainly still goes to show that we need to, uh, we need the body of Christ who could love one another in God's truth and to keep each other accountable 
to to expose our sins most of the times. And on top of that, if we on top of that, we have to see as well that this new life that we're supposed to live under God, this new self that we are supposed to put on, it finds itself lived out in a community of believers called the church, right? So let me read with you um, this passage, um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 25. Um, you can have a look at this. And you might recognize some very similar wording as what we saw um, earlier from Romans chapter 1, right? Remember the futility of their minds and their darkened hearts? Well, re remember that in Romans 1 and look at what Paul is saying to the church here in chapter 4. He says that, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart, right? Reminds you of Romans 1, what we just read at the very beginning. Verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, right? To repent, right? To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, and look at this very carefully, therefore, having put away falsehood, that means having repented from your idolatry, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so when you see in verse 25, after having put away falsehood, and this includes idolatry, let each of us speak truth with his neighbor because we are what? Members one of another. How can we speak truth to one another with strangers? Of course you can, but how are you going to do that regularly? That person might just like leave you forever and you, that, you just burn that bridge, right? It's, this is meant to be understood in the context of a meaningful, committed community of believers, right? Members of one another. Furthermore, when we read chapter 4 and 5 in context, it's about the church, okay? So if you want to read the entire chapter, you know it's about the church. And so together, we are to walk in love and truth and build one another up in Christ. And I mentioned earlier that as Christians, we need to revolutionize the way our understanding of work for Jesus. But on top of that, we really also need to greatly improve our understanding of the church in God's plan and purposes for us. And I think that one of the biggest factors that Christian healthcare workers end up idolizing their factor, and this is my humble opinion, I think that one of the biggest factors is because, number one, they don't get the importance of church. Like church is always an afterthought. Number two, their work schedule gives them, I'm talking about healthcare workers here, their work schedule gives them convenient excuses to skip church to which very few brothers and sisters would ever keep them accountable in any meaningful or proper way. And number three, even if they do join church, they are rarely confronted about idolatry and these kind of chats literally never almost happen, never, almost never happen. So if, if they're not in church, that's already a problem. If they're even in church and they do not hear about these things, then when are they going to hear about it? When will they be confronted so that they can repent and come and embrace God's grace fully and put on the new stuff properly, right? So you can already see how important it is that um, the, the role of the church in God's plan for all believers, Christian healthcare workers alike. There are some Christians, and I'm going to end on this note, there are some Christians who think that it is okay to skip church since you are serving God at work anyways. Some may even think that it is okay to just go off and focus on career development for 10 years and then come back and actively serve in church later. But the question is, are you orientating your life around job and careers in doing that? Because if we are, then that is not just, isn't that just another way to idolize work, right? I think that that's usually very likely the case, although there are some exceptions, and I actually do know one or, one or two great exceptions. But idolatry tends to also see people centering their lives on something other than Christ and his church. So I'd, like, I'd say that we need to think deeply and seriously about our meaningful commitment and service to Jesus' local church, even as we think about how to approach work faithfully as Christians. 
because the church plays a big role in any Christian's life and also in their fight against idolatry. And it is a huge, it is one of the, the great spiritual blessings that we have received in Christ that now we are part of this body and that we can speak to one another in truth and love and hold each other accountable. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that um, you've reminded us tonight of um, the glories of your gospel and what the dangers are of idolatry of work and how that might look like. Um, this topic, Lord, is very um, complex and it is sometimes very hard to suss out idolatry because it is uh, an issue of someone's heart and it is often very uh, well guarded and and not to be uh, not something that people like to talk about. But Lord, I pray that tonight um, the word of God would pr uh, pierce those that hear it whether it's here or live or those that are listening on recording and that they will take it seriously, um, this call to uh, repent from the idolatry of work or what or whatever work promises them and to turn uh, and recommit themselves uh, as Jesus' disciples and start, start the very long and difficult um, process of reorienting their lives according to Christ and his word and working out how that might look like with other brothers and sisters who seek to do the same. And uh, we thank you so much that we have uh, this fellowship that we could gather once a month to encourage each other, uh, especially in this niche that we have, as Malaysian healthcare workers, as Christians. And we pray a lot that uh, many more will come um, and join these events and also be blessed uh, by what they hear. And I pray as well, Lord, that um, uh, in our networking groups, that people will be uh, able to uh, open up and be honest and uh, and and also uh, edify one another with uh, the truth of God and to work out in their lives what needs to be changed uh, so that they can honor your uh, honor your son more. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Thanks, Odin. I think that was very challenging, as you mentioned right at the start of your talk that um, idolatry is actually spiritual suicide and that sets the tone already that it, it is a serious issue that we have to think about as Christians, even as, you know, for a Christians for a long time, idolatry can take, you know, different forms and we can easily fall into the traps of idolatry and we need to constantly check our hearts, even though, you know, we know a lot, but um, you know, as you said, that the church is essential for us um, to strive together, right? So that was very encouraging as well. So now it's time for questions and comments. So I can see that there's a few questions from Slido, and it's not too late now to go on Slido and put some questions that you have, you know, um, and we can get them answered while the talk is still fresh in our brains. So I'll pick a few questions for or speaker, you can. Uh, if you have not, uh, you, yeah, if you have, you don't have any questions, you can upvote the questions that you want to see answered. So, well, maybe we can post the link again, the slider link for those who don't have the link on the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, we have a few questions. Um, I'm going to pick the one that has the most votes. Um, so um, someone asked, do you have examples on how it can look like? So how idolatry can look like, for example, financial, um, because you mentioned that most of the time it's not obvious. So how subtle can it be? And how can we lie or how can we deceive ourselves? Okay. Um, so Cindy, um, I saw that you posted something in the chat. Is that the, is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Well, I just want to make sure that I'm reading it right. Cause it says financial eczema. <laughs> okay. I, I think, I think he posted, uh, this person also posted that, uh, it's a typo. It's, um, uh, because not eczema. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought it was some kind of theological metaphor. I was like, wow, very interesting on like this person. Okay. Yeah. So do you have examples of how idolatry of da 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 da? Most of the time, it's not obvious how subtle can it be? How can we lie to ourselves? Yeah, so I mean, um, 
I think with finances, and this is this is okay, there's many examples. I can just give you one quick one. Okay. So most most Christians, even Christians that are um clear on the gospel, right? They they can they can clearly say with a clear conscience that um say I want to specialize or I want to choose this job because um it gives so-called time, money, flexibility for ministry. Okay, they can say it all in one breath, and there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Because obviously, um, living in KL, for example, is expensive, right? And if you have you want to start a family, you better be ready to, to, to fork out some money for them as well, right? I have two kids. It's very expensive. It's very expensive to have one kid. To have two kids, three kids, is expensive. And so um, um, it's not necessarily wrong, anything wrong with that. But one thing I find is that, um, especially for Christian healthcare workers, sometimes it can be, there can be no end to that. So we can say that, yes, we want to specialize or we want to do this job or that job uh, because it gives more money. But to, to what extent? Like how much money is enough? And that's, that's a question that I think that all Christians, um, not just healthcare workers, we need to ask ourselves. Because if we're not able to at least try to figure out like, okay, this is roughly how much we need and to live within our means or to have some basic savings or, you know, a rainy fund or something like that, then I think that can sometimes be an idolatry because the thing about idolatry, one of the things is that you're never satisfied, right? So you'll get more money. Maybe you are, right now you're like a houseman, you make 5K, right? Then later you are UD48, you make like 7K. And then after that, you become a specialist, you make like 10K, right? And, and, and then it's like, it's never enough. It's like, so when is, in, when is enough? 10K is not enough, okay? Okay, then I'm gonna now I want to go to private. Now I'm making 20, 30k a month. Oh, okay, but that's not enough. Okay, now I'm gonna go and work into two private hospitals. Now I'm making 50k a month. So when when is when how much is enough? If it's never enough and you and there's no uh, honest, sincere way of trying to figure out in a responsible way, and that ha that has to do a little bit with accounting and, and and financing and budgeting and all these things. If and then I think that can also sometimes become an, a very like subtle version of idolatry as well, because it's never enough. You just want more and more and more because that's security for you. More, the more the better. You can get more, get more. So I think that's it's subtle in that sense, lah. Because there's no end point. Number one, so therefore you can never be satisfied with more. And number two, it is kind of uh, masked by very, very justifiable things, such as like, yeah, I have kids, or you know, it's expensive to send them overseas, or if it's you know, blah blah blah, all these things, lah. Right. Thanks, Yodrin. I think that was clearly explained and how you explained the subtlety of what what you know, truly satisfy satisfy you know, someone's um, you know, passions and all that desires. Okay, um, we can do a few more questions. So the next one is, how do I counter my incompetency effectively such that I don't neglect church involvement or ministry? So how do I counter my incompetency effectively such that I don't neglect church involvement or mystery, uh, mis ministry? Right. Um, mm, I mean, this is a tough question to answer because um, it kind of on the surface level, it, it's, it looks like a, a practical question, but, but I think that this person doesn't mean it just in a practical sense, right? Like how do you counter your incompetency such that you don't neglect, right? Because time is like a fixed, it's a fixed amount. You only have 24 hours in a day. You can't just, in, you can't just create more hours in a day. Um, so if you spend more time doing work because you're ineffective, incompetent or whatever it is, um, then obviously you're going to have less time for church and ministry, right? So I think that um, very often what we do is we look at just the short term. Um, the short-term solutions, you know, uh, work harder, pull all-nighters, things like that, to just kind of get through, right? To overcome our incompetencies in the short term. But really what we need to, to think about is actually long-term, what, like practically speaking, what are we doing about that? You know, is there is there a root cause as to why we are incompetent or ineffective? Yeah. And if you found that root cause and it's something that you cannot change, then it's worthwhile asking whether or not that's the right job for yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really like a, like a, it's a hard truth to, to face sometimes, but you have to ask yourself whether or maybe you are not in the right path um, because it's definitely, you're not, supposed to be so, you're not supposed to be so busy that you don't have time for Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so um, that's, that's my, my quick answer for the question. Right. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for answering that. Um, Okay, uh, let's do one more question. Okay, sorry, we have to pick 
um, just a few questions. Um, don't feel bad <laughs> because I didn't pick your question. I think all of them are good questions. Um, okay. Right, this one, um, a new one. Speaking of the example, frustration when something is not achieved, deep satisfaction when something is achieved. How do we draw the line of idolatry and how do we overcome it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I think it's really difficult to draw the line. It, it really is because that line may, may be a bit different depending on who it is that you're, you're, you're talking to. Okay, that, that's why that's not probably the best. That's probably not the answer you want to <laughs> want to hear because you as the you know as healthcare workers we want to have a clear line. You know, more than thirty seven point five degrees Celsius means a low grade fever or something like that. You know, we don't like like where's the line and you don't know how to draw the line all these things. But but um, it is difficult because then otherwise we will end up thinking about it in terms of like criteria and does it fit the criteria and then this therefore is idolatry. This therefore is not. You know, um, but I think um, what helps is to look at the pattern, the pattern. If you look at yourself, you're regularly feeling deep satisfaction um, in work, and then your your emotions, your your and your um, stress levels are going up and down drastically based on what happens at work. Then yeah, most probably you have already unknowingly made work your identity and a source of your satisfaction, a source of all those things, and so therefore uh, it would. You would, you would be crossing the line of idolatry in a sense, lah, which I still think that, you know, if you want to talk a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, whoever's asking that question, of course, definitely um, that, that requires some, some specific pastoral tailored care. Um, but I would be like, I would say that a good, maybe a good example um, is like whatever happens at work, you're like, if it's good, then you are thankful to God about it, but you wouldn't make too much of a hoot about it. And that if, if something bad happens, then you know that, hey, everything is still in God's hands and so you're going to be responsible and, and make it better, you know? But for, for some people, um, you can see, and this happens in non-Christians a lot, but you can see some Christians responding that way. Let's say if their boss scolded them or something like that at work, maybe they screwed up or they forgot something about the patient during present case, case rounds, grand, grand rounds, and then they, they got, say, scolded by the, the professor consultant. Right. And then th th their entire day is just ruined. I mean, you know, they take it so like, oh, my, my, oh my gosh, my professor thinks I'm an idiot. Like, you know, like I think they're like completely wrecked by it the whole day. I think that's I think that's a line. Huh? It's like it's like, why do you care so much about what your professor thinks until your whole day is ruined? You know what I'm saying? That's just a quick example, but it has to be contextualized. Yeah, I do agree that uh, we, have, we have to look at the context of each person. But yeah, thank you so much, Edwin, for answering all the questions.